welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, I would like to share with you some interesting endgame moments, some from recent games, others from the past. Well, let's start with our first example that was played between Huschenbath against Hankin. In this game, White seems to have the initiative. Why? Because White has a more active king. And unlike in the opening or in the middle of the game, where we typically like to hide our king in a castling position behind our pawns, in the end game, we oftentimes use our king to attack, to play actively. In fact, sometimes even creating mating nets. And that's exactly what's happening here, that the white king is a very active participant in the attack, despite that we are in an endgame. At the moment, it was Black's turn, so I suggest you take a few minutes and try to think about, from Black's perspective, what should you do. Considering that there is even material on the board, the game should be a draw if Black defends correctly. Remember that even if Black gets the opportunity to give up his bishop for White's only pawn, and we would be left with a rook and knight versus a rook, even if Black loses his last pawn, the game should be a draw unless Black makes some mistakes. So therefore the challenge is how to make sure we don't make a mistake and lose this game as black. In the actual game, black made a careless move and moved the rook to a1. Generally speaking, it's a typical concept that uh, one would put the rook on a1 so the rook can give checks from the side, from a5 and a6. However, in this case, this could have cost black the game. White now has a way to win the game by hiding behind black's pawn. And that's quite a nice concept in that white now can capture on g5, capture back. And the, the interesting part here is that if black would not have the g5 pawn, the game would be a relatively easy draw. But in this case, that extra pawn that black has, and it looks like a nice passed pawn, but in reality is it gives white a little hiding place from the checks. And therefore, white can win here by playing f6 now. And... For example, if g4, the king is going to f5, and then the king is going to g6. So now you see what I was talking about. The king cannot be checked from behind on g1 because of that very pawn on g3. And the black pawn is just one move too short, because of course if the pawn would be already on g2, the pawn would be ready to advance, promote, and check white's king, and avoid the threatening checkmate with rook h8. So now the big problem that black has is that there is a checkmate threat on the back rank. Moving the king to g8 would not help at all because white would have the opportunity to give two well-placed checks and then promote the pawn again with a check. So therefore, in the position, the king can only try to run the other direction. And this is another critical moment where white needs to play accurately. White has two natural moves right now. One is to advance the pawn with a check, and the other one is to check black's king with a rook to chase it further out. Only one of them do the job. Checking with a rook is not working because after king d7 and f7, Black will just ignore the situation and advance his own pawn and promote it with a check. So in this case, white cannot make progress and in fact white has to be careful not to lose because whoever promotes the pawn with a check will have an initiative. White will have to play at this point 
rook d8, trying to force the king to capture the rook and then promote the pawn with a check. However, the king is not forced to capture it and can just walk away. Okay, let's go back just a little bit and uh, see the situation here where the correct move is, on the other hand, to play f7. Now black has to be careful. If the king goes to f8, then we reach the same scenario as we saw after the variation when the king went to g8. Then king f8, white would just play rook h8 check, and then promote the f-pawn with a check. So the king had to go to e7. And now the easiest win is king g7 threatening to promote the pawn with a check. The black rook can stop it from two directions. If it goes to f1, then white will play just king g8, protecting the pawn and threatening to advance it with a discovered check. On the other hand, if the rook tries to stop white's pawn from the other side by playing rook a8, then white's response will be the simple rook h1, threatening with giving a check on e1 and then promoting the f-pawn when the black king is away, a file away from the f-pawn. Okay, let's go back again all the way to the beginning. Black did play rook to a1 in this position and white made a mistake, did not realize the winning opportunity be trading the knight for the bishop and then playing f6, but played f6 right away. And that missed the chance and gave black the chance to come back and save the game. Black realized that the rook actually belongs on e1, making sure it's pinning the knight. And now after king f5 and white has the same idea to go back to g6 and then checkmate on h8, Black just in time has the opportunity to sacrifice the rook and get the pawn and reach a rook versus bishop endgame, which as we know is an objectively drawn position. And that's what happened in the game and the game eventually ended in a draw. Let's go back one more time to the starting position and see what black should do here. Well, black's best bet is just to do nothing. Just keep the circumstance as it is, make a waiting move by rook e2. Now, if white advances the f-pawn, black would do just the same, giving up the rook for the knight and then getting white's last pawn, transposing to a rook versus bishop endgame. It's important to notice, though, that the good-looking bishop f6 is not as good as it looks because after king f6 and rook e4, white checkmates. So that's certainly not a good idea. Alternatively, another option is to play king g8, attacking the white rook, and then go back to f8 after the rook moves away. Let's move on to our next example that has a bit more pieces on the board. Here we go. In this position, it was Black's turn in a game between Saltayev and Meister. Well, what is going on? A lot of pieces are hanging, both queens are under attack, and, more importantly, White is even threatening to checkmate on the next move. So it seems that black is in serious trouble. There is no way black could avoid losing the queen or getting checkmated. Playing a move like a6, which is a natural looking move, just trying to escape from the rook c8 check. And then of course, if right now knight takes queen, then black also knight takes queen and everything is under control. The problem is that even though the black king escapes, it escapes to a square where the black queen now will be captured with a check. So therefore, this is no solution. The game itself continued with black playing queen d7 with the idea that if now white proceeds with rook c8 check, black could capture that rook and then if knight takes 
back, then knight captures the white queen. The problem was that now white continued in the game, playing queen f7, causing unsolvable problems for black. Now, if queen takes queen, the checkmate is back on c8, and uh, otherwise black will just lose the queen. Let's go back again and see what did black miss, because despite as bad as it looks, this position for black, black in reality, can save the day right now. Try to think and then come back and listen to the correct answer. And that beautiful move that black missed was queen f1. An ingenious move forcing the rook to move away from the c file and now black can safely capture on f3. When you see that you're in trouble in a position, then don't be shy to looking at even unprobable moves that normally wouldn't work. You never know, it may work, especially moves that are forceful or checks. Let's move on and see a rook endgame now. In this position, black has an extra pawn. However, white has a far advanced pawn all the way to c7. So all white would need to do is to promote that pawn to win. Of course, that's not so simple because the black rook is sitting on c8 and blocks it. If white would attempt to immediately play rook d8 check, naturally black would not capture but just move out of the check and white would not have made significant progress. White came up with an interesting game plan. Started out immediately by playing h4. Now the idea is that if black captures this, then already white is winning easily with the check followed with another check and then doubling up the rooks on the 8th rank forcing that trade on d8 which of course will result in white winning a rook. So let's go back h4 of course black is not forced to capture but that means that black will have other problems. If black now would play f6 then white would have a pleasant choice between the idea of doubling the rooks on the 7th rank by playing rook e7 or simply continue bringing the king similarly as they did in the game. Black continued by playing king h7. Pawn captured and king g6. Rook protected the pawn on g5 and black played f6, trying to create a passed pawn. And now white simply moved the king. King d2, f to g5, and king to d3. Now the king is eyeing to go to the queen side via c4 and b5 and c6, and then the rooks would be free up for white to win black's g pawns, and then later come back, exchange rooks, and win the game. If black now plays g4, the white king could just walk next to the pawn to e4 and then to the f file and capture it. Black responded by playing a5. White continued with rook d8. Now black is in a bind because there neither rook can move. King f6, king e4. Black is kind of getting in a zugzwang situation g4 and now white was ready to double up the rooks on the 8th rank with a chuck and a second chuck and here we go a very nice idea in how to further the power of that c7 pawn let's look at the next example which is a very interesting position where black is threatening to capture on g2. Also, black is up a pawn already. So if white, for example, would make a move like, uh, say, rook to f2, black could just trade off on f2 everything and capture the pawn 
on A3 or advance it, and black would be still a pawn up. But white came up with a very good looking move, and that is to play bishop f6. Well, what's going on now? The black queen obviously is hanging, and also white made a discovered attack in that the white rook is now threatening to capture on e8. So, if queen or pawn captures on f6, then white would play rook takes rook on e8, and black would be in very serious trouble. So the question is, how can black get out from this difficult looking position? Generally, the first thing you do is you look at forceful moves. See if there is anything forceful that can end well for our side. And that's the case here. Black continues with rook g2 check. White has no choice but to move to the corner. Although it seems at first that it didn't really solve black's problems. The queen is still hanging, the rook is still hanging, the trouble still seems to be there. But with a nice simplification combination, black can save the day. Namely, by rook h2 check. So now white needs to react to this. White cannot afford to move out with the king because black would checkmate immediately on g2. So white had to trade. And now came the key move, another forceful move, bishop to f3. If rook takes, rook e1, king g1, and now black was ready to exchange all the pieces and get the bishop, pawn takes pawn, and now bishop d5. Well, let's do evaluation. White has a rook against a bishop and three pawns. Having three pawns is certainly sufficient compensation uh, against being done on exchange. And I would consider this an, as an approximately equal position. And now let's see some beautiful endgame studies by the Hungarian-American Grandmaster Banker. Here is the first example where white is up a bishop, however, black has a very dangerous outside pass pawn on the A-file. And it is black's turn at this moment. And uh, the first thing to think about is what happens if black simply advances the A-pawn? How will we catch it? Obviously, white cannot even dream about catching it with his king because it's behind it and neither with the pawns. So the only one potentially that could catch it is white's bishop. However, with the current positioning of the white bishops, it's not so simple to get anywhere near the A1 square in the foreseeable future, especially in view of black's d4 pawn. I suggest you try to think and figure out the creative way how white can win this game. And the correct move right now is to play d3. Hey, but this doesn't even get the bishop any closer, does it? It doesn't, but it prevents something very important in that if white would play bishop h4 right away, black would have the opportunity to play d3 and then king d4 and win the white pawns. So therefore, the correct answer right now is to play d3, preventing black's d3 move. Okay, but the pawn now advances. Bishop h4 and the pawn advances. It's still not clear how that bishop will catch the pawn. Well, it does not necessarily have to catch it. That's the beauty of it. Bishop move to f6, a2, and now c4. If now black does en passant, then indeed the bishop captures back on c3 and the pawn is caught. But what if black simply plays king c5, hanging onto the pawn? And here comes the beautiful part, where white plays king b7, allows that a pawn to promote in view of the upcoming checkmate. A real jewel. Let's go back just a little bit and uh, see what would happen if black would play d3 immediately. 
Then capturing on d3 would be a mistake again because black would play a5 and as white would try to catch that pawn with the bishop going to h4 and f6, the black king in the meantime would get the opportunity to move up to d4 and then capture the white pawns. So therefore white has to play very accurately again and the only way to win is to play c4, check, gaining the momentum, king captures back and now bishop b6, preventing the a pawn from advancing. If now the black king would go to b3 and c2, the white bishop would just go to a5 protecting the pawn and then the white king in the meantime would get a chance to get back to the game. But how about king b5 and then advancing the a pawn? Well, white has to play very accurately but can win the game. King c7, king c4, bishop c3, a3, and the king is coming just on time. A2, king e5, king b3, king d4, king c2. And now black is threatening to advance the pawn, promote the pawn, and then capture white's last pawn on d2. But white, timely, last minute, protected the d2 pawn, and therefore white is winning easily. Quite an amazing composition. Let's move on and see two more jewels from Grandmaster Banker. Here we go. In this endgame, bishop versus pawns, again the challenge is the same in that black has a far advanced pass pawn that's only two ranks away from promotion. The first move is certainly a very natural one by white preventing the a pawn to advance. But black has another pawn. Now, the correct move is to play king c5. And again, an unprobable situation when checkmate is in the picture. White is threatening with bishop c2. Therefore, black had to move the king. And now, it's time to race. Both pawns are advancing and promoting to queens. And white is the one who starts action first. Queen captures. Now if the king moves to b2, white would checkmate in just two moves. So therefore the king went to c3. White follows with queen d4, only move king to b3. And now an ingenious idea, queen a4. If now the king moves out to c3, white checkmates in one move. Or if the king moves to b2 with queen c2, White checkmates in two moves. And of course, if king captures queen, then the beautiful bishop c2. Well, what does this tell you? That even in endgames, tactics or checkmate can be around. And finally, one last example, also composed by Grandmaster Banker. Again, the challenge is the same. Black has a dangerous pass pawn on the king's side, about to get promoted in just three more moves. How can we catch it? The natural move, which would be playing b4, doesn't quite do it because the black king will get very quickly to the other side of the board. Even though it catches the black pawn, white will not be able to make progress because the white king will be constantly busy in protecting the b4 pawn. And this is a drawn endgame. The correct way is to play king c2. We want to keep that pawn on b3 for now. King f5 and now king d3. h3, bishop b1. If h2, then here is the important discover check, followed by bishop e4. The white king is keeping the black king away from the only pawn that white has. Let's go back. If instead of h2, black plays king e5, then simply king e3, and again bishop e4, and white wins. For example, 
king d6, king d4, king e6, king c5, and black keeps getting in Zugzwang. White will just make a waiting move, and the black king will have to keep going down, and the white king gets to c6. For example, king c8, another waiting move, king b8, and king d7, and eventually black gets in Zugzwang. Well, some very instructive bishop and games by Grandmaster Banker. Thank you for listening and I'll be back next week with some more chess ideas. Thank you and bye-bye. Mm -hmm.